Our guest lecturer, Ingrid Kennard, is an author, she's an innovative scholar, an accomplished artist, and according to rate my professor, a very nice person. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Kennard is a professor of sociology at the University of Western Ontario in London, Canada. She's published extensively in about family ties across the world. So work explores intergenerational relationships, Adult sibling ties. We can have an interesting conversation about that. I think it's a very good answer. And aging and the policy implications of these important issues. Uh, as an example of her work, in 2004, Dr. Knights and Julie McMullen received the Richard Kalish Innovative Publication Award from the Gerontological Society of America for their work on sociological ambivalence and family ties. As many of you know, Dr. Kanaitis has ties to Oregon State University. In 2001, she was the Peterson Visiting Scholar, and I think for most of us, you know, uh, except for the faculty, we missed out on that. Um, she has co-authored with Alexis Walker, Chapters on Family Relationships, and this spring, she and Rick Sederston will be uh, conducting people workshops and learning personal research at the Lyles Winter School on Life Point in Switzerland. So we're very excited to have you back. Uh, so happy you're here, and we look forward to uh, the presentation. So uh, please welcome Dr. Thank you very much, Heidi. Um, at the risk of embarrassing you, and I will preface it by saying I've had colleagues for decades who've done the same thing. I actually say Canidas. But you've probably heard the other pronunciation more often. <laughs> so I understand the mistake. And, and I'm really glad to hear that right, my professor said I was a nice person, although I think that's kind of a neutral escape from actually committing yourself one way or the other. But <laughs> I remember uh, a number of years ago, I thought when it was first coming out, I'd just check it to see what kind of things were there. And so I logged on and checked what was said about me. There was exactly one comment. What's the symbol for a really bad? A bunch of tomatoes, or is that the movie one? Oh, Thumb. Yeah. Not good. It wasn't good. So I read the comment, and it was describing how I was a really bad professor because I showed up in class. All I did was tell them what was in the textbook already. It was, there was no point in going. You really shouldn't take this course. It was terrible. But I didn't teach the course that they were talking about. <laughs> so I've told my classes that since. I never looked at it again. <laughs> and I think of it as a really unreliable indicator, except when it says that I'm nice. <laughs> I'm really glad that Heidi mentioned Alexis Walker. I, I really feel like I'm in the land of Alexis, and it was really due to Alexis that I came here in the first place because of her efforts for the Peterson Scholar Award and just such a lovely friendship, uh, both professionally and personally, which I miss, as I'm sure you all do as well. It brought me, however, to other people here, and I feel so lucky to still be in touch with good friends and colleagues here over the years. That's been terrific. And I'm sure, like you, I have a funny feeling combination a sense of her presence and her absence. So unusual to be here and not see her, and yet so aware of her presence here. So I really do think of Alexis as I do most things, and but particularly when I'm here. So today, I am going to cover three different topics and the reflecting things I've been working on lately. One is ambivalence, especially in intergenerational ties. I know you're a bit of a mixed group, so I apologize to the people who know some of this stuff cold, and um, for the others who don't, I hope I don't go through it too swiftly. The second topic is age relations, intergenerational ties, and the recession. And the third um, is ongoing sibling and parent ties of gay and lesbian adults. Um, I think of them as ranging from the more academic to the more personal from my point of view. And I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the second topic, but I want to use the first one as a way of leading into it. All three topics deal in some way with the disconnect between macro and micro levels of analysis and reflect my general concern about our failure as researchers and as citizens to connect different levels of reality in our understanding of family relationships. Today I'm going to give you a sampling from, on each of these topics of what I consider some current hits and misses when it comes to connecting macro and micro levels of analysis uh, when we talk about social life. But first I want to say a little bit about the different levels of analysis um, that are often described as macro, meso, and micro. Are these terms familiar to you? 
are the things that you're using a lot. So I'll just do that really quickly then. At the micro level, we're talking about the individual experience um, and relationships that we engage in. At the meso level, we're talking about the social institutions of work and family and others as well, but in particular that tends to be a focus. And at the macro level, looking at cultural beliefs and values, politics, economy, and socially structured relations based on class, gender, race, ethnicity, and age. And I will talk somewhat more about age shortly. When I refer to macro, micro hits and misses, I'm really trying to draw attention to this issue of connecting different levels of analysis. And I really view this as a topic which goes well beyond an academic exercise. A hit means that different levels of analysis have been related to one another effectively. And by a miss, I'm referring to the failure to make a connection um, between different levels of social reality. And I think of this as a disconnect which has significant consequences. As I hope to illustrate, there is a practical as well as theoretical relevance to considering how individual experience is embedded in larger social institutions and larger social realities. As individuals, our relationships occur at the micro level, but they are embedded in social institutions, which are in turn operating in the larger context of socially structured relations. We have been slow to include age as one of the central organizing features of social life. And one consequence of this is we tend to have an ongoing acceptance of ageism that we would rarely accept in terms of other socially structured relations. The three levels of analysis are interactive, ideally, and exert mutual influences, both in theory and in practice. So this means, in my view, that if we are going to effectively initiate social policy, we cannot assume that it operates simply in a top-down fashion. We really have to, at the same time, think about how individuals act as they go about their daily lives and how they are, in turn, influenced by what's happening at these macro and meso levels. Now to my first topic, ambivalence. I was asked to consider the use of ambivalence in research on intergenerational relationships over the past decade at an upcoming symposium at the GSA meetings in San Diego, so in a couple of weeks. And the symposium was really intended to mark the decade since Alexis Walker oversaw the special issue on JMF in which we had a debate about ambivalence, a, a really interesting exchange, and it had Alexis's classic insight to see that this was going to be a good way to present um, conceptual arguments. So let me tell you a bit about why this concept appeals to me. As a researcher, I believe that a sound theoretical framework needs a number of components. It should deal with continuity and change in relationships. Some aspects will be continuous, there will be elements of change. It should be multi-level, this idea of the macro, meso, micro connection that I've just outlined. It should also be multifaceted. It should be able to talk about how one realm relates to another. So we don't only talk about family. We connect it to issues like work and recreation and religion and so on. We also should be thinking about diversity and inequality. And I mention them both because I think we've had a tendency to focus more on diversity or difference and sometimes to forget about inequality. And we want to be thinking about them, especially in relation to intersecting uh, social relations. This emphasis on individual agency and context, the kind of work that Ricky Satterson's done a lot on, where we emphasize the fact that we make attempts to act on our own behalf and on behalf of other people, but we're doing that within the constraints and opportunities that exist. At the same time, if enough of us do things differently, we can change established way of doing things. So again, we should be focusing on this interactive potential. I think it's really important that theories deal with negotiated relationships, focusing on action relationships, not just outcomes, how we work out our relationships with each other. And finally, I think it's ideal if a theory encourages us to take on a role as advocate. So in this case of the topics I'm discussing today, on behalf of the old, on behalf of the young, on behalf of um, gay, lesbian, bi, and transgender individuals and families. I think if we look at some established theoretical frameworks, the three that combined to actually help us take these different components into account are the life course, critical, and feminist perspectives. But as you all know, that's a pretty large <laughs> chunk of theory. So in my view, 
it means that we need a concept that helps us bring them together, helps us when we're looking at family relationships to be thinking of these different components, to be drawing from these major theoretical perspectives so that we can look more uh, effectively at what's happening, happening in families. And in, the stud in this case, I think that would be the real basis for develop developing or working on the concept of ambivalence, where we're focusing very much on working out contradictory forces. I'm going to ask some questions. If you want to show your hands, fine. And if you don't, that's fine. But I just want to get you thinking about it. So how many of you have children? Parents, a long-term partner, okay. How many of you feel close to your children or your parents or your partners, okay? And how many of you ever find your relationship with your children or your partner or your parents irritating, frustrating, challenging, <laughs> overwhelming, unhappy, disappointing, conflicted? Anybody? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Now, a somewhat rhetorical question. How many of you are in the labor force or full-time students? Okay. How many of you feel that there has to be a better way? <laughs> okay. A better way of organizing work or education so that it is compatible with the rest of your life, including family relationships. A better way of organizing child care so that parenting is more compatible with paid work or being a full-time student. How many of you are aware of the colliding of these two spheres of your world? How many of you are aware of trying to work out the contradictions between them? How many of you feel that you carry more of the weight for parental care or child care or your personal relationship or paid work because of your gender or your relative income? These really are the experiences that Julie McMullen and I were trying to capture in our discussion of the concept of ambivalence. When we talk about ambivalent feelings, we are not disputing that family members feel close to one another, see each other often, or support one another. We are also not talking about relationships as always being conflict-ridden. We are talking about the ongoing challenge to negotiate the contradictions of close relationships and of competing expectations that stem from the way that social life is organized. We are also talking about the additional complexity that comes from the contradictions of structured social relations that create different capacities and resources for negotiating family relationships. Let me make a few points about the concept of ambivalence. First is, of course, the idea of contradiction viewed as a fundamental feature of family and social life so that we see the coexistence of both solidarity and conflict. Second is an emphasis on a multi-level approach. We can look at ambivalence as a psycho in the psychological or individual way, or we can take a sociological approach to ambivalence at the meso and macro levels. So if we're taking this multi-level approach, ideally, sociological ambivalence as, ambivalence as a concept helps us to link the contradictions, conflict, and inequality at the macro level to social institutions at the meso level and in turn to relationships with members in families at the micro level. At the macro level, we're talking about these structured social relations in part of gender, class, race, ethnicity, and age. And I want to just tell you what I mean when I talk about age relations following the critical perspective. I'm referring to how different age groups are treated in society in terms of expectations, responsibilities, privileges, and resources. The story of age relations, of course, is uh, crisscrossed or intersects with the stories of class and gender and ethnicity and race and sexual orientation, but I'm going to focus primarily on age. A multi-level view of ambivalence emphasizes the reciprocal links among these levels of analysis. Okay? So ideally, in, in theory at least, the development of ambivalence as a concept that's looking at both psychological and sociological ambivalence can take a multi-level approach and can look at connections. But unfortunately, the, there's a big macro-micro miss, I think, so far in um, what's been happening with the concept of ambivalence because so much of it has focused on this micro level, looking at mixed feelings, contradictory emotions, behaviors, or assessments of relationships as both positive and negative. 
There are some important exceptions, including by researchers from OSU, including Karen Hooker, where micro-level ambivalence is placed into the larger context of age or gender relations. As well, there have been some more recent studies of the experience of migrant workers and immigrants, an examination of the interplay of gender, family, and religion, and a study of disability and the law, which have really pushed the amb uh, concept of ambivalence beyond the micro-level. But studies of intergenerational ambivalence typically isolate relationships from this larger picture, focusing on individual emotional states, mixed feelings in, in particular, and their individual consequences for well-being. This tends to treat the challenges of family life that are public issues as individual responsibilities or private troubles. Meanwhile, and this brings me to my second topic, there is the issue of age relations, intergenerational ties, and the recession. Here I'm going to argue that we have a reverse emphasis. So I'm suggesting that in terms of the application of ambivalence, we've had people focusing primarily inside families. When we look at the response to the recession, we have the opposite kind of emphasis. So we have a focus on age relations at the societal level in both the public and private sectors. Public, I mean primarily government. We have uh, a ramping up, if you will, of the age war rhetoric and ageism, in part because of this age-based response to the recession. It feeds a return to age war rhetoric. We then see in terms of intergenerational ties within families, we actually have an exception to age segregation in the larger society, that is, generations or age groups mix within families in a way that they don't on the outside. But when it comes to negotiating ties, we have to take into account what's happening on the outside. I believe that studying the impact of the recession on age relations and on intergenerational ties reveals a current big miss by researchers, by policymakers, and by leaders in the private sector. And I think the primary disconnect that I would talk about is the failure to connect what is happening inside families at the micro level to what is happening outside families at the meso and macro levels. Too much research is focused on this inside focus, the intergenerational high in families, and on the outside, policy and practice in both the public and private sectors tends to focus largely outside families, this focus on age relations. So now I'd like to give you some examples and uh, uh, indicate why that this is my argument or this is the conclusion I've drawn. I've been for a few years now uh, covering or following the coverage of the recession, um, government and private sector responses to it, positions taken about what's happened since the recession and so on. So um, two things. This is not covering research because we haven't caught up yet in terms of research. We all know how long the turnaround time is in journal publications. And another, I'm going to rely um, more on Canadian information than U.S. information, so I welcome hearing if you think there's a disconnect between our respective experiences, but based on my reading, I don't think it's a major one. So, in terms of examples, since the economic recession that began in September 2008, or at least that's when most of us knew about it, both Canada and the U.S. have witnessed a shrinking middle class, lower median incomes, higher unemployment rates, and more poverty. How does the recession relate to the juxtaposition of age relations in society with intergenerational relations in families? Are age relations in society mirrored in intergenerational relations in families? A general disconnect between the personal and public domains is seen in the contrast between how we regard old people who are members of our family and how we treat old people as a society. As Lillian Zimmerman, herself in her 80s, a researcher in Canada, observes, while we love our parents and grandparents as individuals, we don't much like older people as a society. So, in terms of the response to the recession, let's look first at the recession and age relations. Private and public sector policies and actions that target a particular age group typically ignore what is actually happening in families, limiting their likelihood of success. The contradictions that characterize age-based responses to the recession, what might be termed structural or sociological ambivalence, often extend to fundamental contradictions between what is happening inside and outside families. 
We know that a bad economy is felt most acutely by younger and older Canadians and Americans and younger and older workers, the issue of age relations. Younger workers have, ha have a hard time getting into and staying in the labour market at the same time that older workers are led out of it through layoffs, bankruptcies or early retirement offers. Once out, older workers have a tough time getting back in. Many older workers retire expecting to move into bridge jobs after leaving their main long-term job career, an expectation that is increasing. Others hadn't planned to look for work, but with quickly eroding resources are forced to do so. In both cases, retirees are now competing with younger workers who are trying to get into the labor force and are becoming less selective about whether their work is full-time, includes benefits, or is well-paid. At the same time, older workers are often seen as blocking access to jobs for younger workers and thus resented if they stay in the labor force for too long. Meanwhile, older retirees are resented for the pressure they place on the public purse and private pensions and benefit packages. Many employers are doing their best to dodge legacy costs as one way of surviving the recession, leaving growing numbers of retirees who thought they had secure pension and health care coverage suddenly stranded or facing unanticipated out-of-pocket health care expenses. Companies that declare bankruptcy have many debtors in line before the cost of pensions and benefits for former and current employees and retirees are even considered. Sinking stock markets have undermined pension investments, and now, as ever, most Canadian and American workers do not have pensions through work. Governments, too, are trying to lower costs by extending the age of eligibility for benefits and pensions, Social Security in the U.S. or Old Age Security in Canada. The impact of the recession on the housing market here has meant increased debt and lost investment and sometimes homes for substantial numbers of older Americans. At the same time, young adults who face a tough time getting into full-time secure jobs may try alternatives including part-time work, volunteer work that they hope will look good on their resumes, like our daughter and, and our son, traveling and returning to school. Young adults pay relatively higher tuition rates than previous age cohorts did. In Canada, although 42% of post-secondary grads, and I've seen some parallel figures for the U.S., have no debt, but 58% of college and university students have a substantial average debt of $20,000 to pay off once they do start earning money. The costs of basics such as housing have gone up considerably more than the rate of inflation. There is no question that Generation Y and the Millennials face considerable challenges to launching a financially stable future. But is blaming older age cohorts the answer? News coverage of the increase in age eligibility for old age security in Canada exemplified the use of age group interests to justify social policy. The merits of raising the age of eligibility for old age security from 65 to 67 were sold to younger people by the federal government's Diane Finley, who warned that, quote, young Canadians will be burdened with a future of sky-high taxes and big debt unless Ottawa acts now to reduce the long-term co costs of government programs. Millennial Bhaskar Amurti observed in the Globe and Mail, which is the self-proclaimed national newspaper of Canada, in March, um, she, her observations hit upon the contradictions of federal policy. She said, quote, When the federal budget was released last week, week, it didn't take long before members of my generation, born after 1982, did the calculations. They'd feel the blow of the austerity measures most severely, severely even though those very measures are meant to, con to correct the strains boomers have put on the system. Generation Y will now have to wait till 65 to claim their old age security. And youth-focused job creation, little of that to be seen. End quote. What happens when young people prolong their time getting an education and delaying entering the labor force? Current and historical trends show that they delay getting into long-term committed relationships and they delay having children. These delays, as I'm sure many of you know, in meeting the traditional timelines of the life course have been inspired the concept emerging adulthood. And I'll go to that again shortly. As analyses of the global recession should have shown us by now, 
Our current economic crisis is not because of an aging population or because the baby boom is taking everything it can. Moves like extending the age of eligibility for old age security and social security are as much a response to the recession as they are to an aging population. A long-term emphasis on reducing taxes and keeping them as low as possible has really served the interests of particular sectors based on wealth rather than based on age. Yet focusing on age relations influences current views about appropriate action in the wake of the recession. That takes me to the age war backlash. The recession provides a great vehicle for observing our tendency to resort to age wars explicitly or indirectly when dealing with major economic problems. Age war rhetoric heightens the impact that age relations already have on social life. A common response to the recession and to its age-related consequences is to treat the problems of the recession as a problem of age wars, often targeting the aging baby boom as the primary culprit. Their needs and greediness are met at the expense of the young. A focus on age relations at the macro level emphasizes the competing interests of age groups. The return of war, age war rhetoric parallels the intergenerational equity debate that I think a lot of us had left behind at the end of the 1990s. Earlier this year, our self-proclaimed paper, The Globe and Mail, ran a bold headline on the front page of the weekend edition. And this covered, uh, it was the front page, and then it was followed by a, a huge two-page spread. So you, the, the visual is you've got this in your face in large, bold font. So on the cover, it says, Do the Millennials Hate the Boomers? Margaret Wente, who is a well-known journalist in Canada, actually comes from the U.S., but she writes a regular column. Margaret Wente says they should. This was followed by the two-page spread to which I referred, entitled Two Solitudes, 1950-1986, with the byline, This week's federal budget put the country's generations in sharp relief. Retirement is happily secured for those of a certain age and now only a fading pipe dream for the 20-somethings. The exchange exemplifies a ten tendency to respond to the challenges of recessionary times by characterizing them as a battle between the young and old. Margaret Wente took the position of the baby boomers under this large font, 1950, her birth year, while Dakshana Bhaskaramurti wrote for Generation Y under a large font, 1986, her birth year. And the clash began with Wente touting the endless advantages of growing up and aging as a baby boomer at the expense of Generation Y, who will pay the price. Bhaskaramurti mirrored this view, lamenting the plight of her generation and ending with, quote, sure the boomers lucked out, but don't expect us to be happy paying for their retirements. Now, for the record, I was born in 1951 and my son Kai in 1986. So these two birth dates resonate with me. <laughs> but Margaret Wente's rant does not. I'm going to give you a, a quick excerpt. Here she goes. Unlike people under 54, we boomers will get every penny of the old age security benefits we've been promised. They actually have a clawback now. It used to be universal. And probably all the health care, too. We are the gilded generation. Things have always gone our way. We grew up in brand new suburbs and went to brand new schools. We never had to fight a war. Remember, this is Canada. Um, <laughs> yeah, we didn't have Vietnam. University was practically free. My, my future husband and I graduated with zero debt and found good jobs right away. Nobody had heard of unpaid internships back then. At work, I joined an excellent defined benefit, punishment, defined benefit pension plan. The younger employees don't get it. I know that lots of younger people won't have it as good as we did. Unlike our own parents who thought it was immoral to dip into their capital, uh, she should see my parents, we boomers would rather spend our savings than preserve. So once again, we see the old age war fire being stoked, reflecting this common response in the public and private sectors to the recession and its aftermath. Much like the intergenerational equity rhetoric that preceded this current version, framing present circumstances as age wars involves characterizing all members of a cohort in the same way. Wendy's attempt to appear balanced and a throwaway line about the plight of some boomers who cannot afford to retire, notwithstanding 
Her rant rests on portraying baby boomers as the generation that won the demographic jackpot. Meanwhile, Generation Y is their victim. Fortunately, some informed and thoughtful readers of the Globe address some of the weaknesses of this artificial standoff. Uh, Don Wilson from Calgary wrote, I lived in an old house full of used furniture, borrowed every penny I could to go to university, came out hugely in debt, fortunate to get a job when 50% of graduates couldn't, and then paid into a social system that my parents used up. I must be a millennial born in 1951. <laughs> Molly Hurd of Halifax wrote, Margaret Wente's picture of boomer privilege certainly wasn't my experience, but at least my generation benefited from a government that invested in youth and realized that providing meaningful jobs and work-related experiences is valuable. We now have a government that has cancelled Katimovic, which was an initiative for young people. We'll be severely curtailing SIDA, a um, bit like your Peace Corps, youth internships, and cutting back on the overseas volunteer opportunities my generation benefited from. And then from Teresa Nickel of Toronto, I'm a boomer who paid for my education with the help of student loans, borrowed from a bank for my first house, and never had a defined benefit plan um, or a union job. I'm going to be needing what little I have left for my own future after providing private skating lessons, competitive swimming lessons, summer camps, daycare, driving lessons, holidays, and post-secondary educations for my still-at-home millennial kids. She provides a really good transition now to talking about intergenerational ties, making the link that we experience age, between age relations and personal reality. So what's happening in families? Well, as all of us know who've done any research in um, aging and family relationships, when we consider these ties, we really see that the interests of the younger generation are regularly championed by the older generations. Years of research in gerontology have shown and continue to show that the safety net for many in the younger ger generation who need it is the older members of their families. Attempts in both the public and private sectors to curtail the resources of older generations work at cross purposes with the efforts of older family members to support younger ones as they try to get a steady footing in a struggling economy. One way to relieve the cost of further education, to lower expenses, and to pay off debt is to live with family members. The prospect of adult children, as I'm sure some of you know, personally as well as professionally, the prospect of adult children living with their parents has gone up dramatically. The return of children to their parents' home often creates ambivalence for parents who are both ready to offer support and ready to have their children launched and independent. Mixed feelings about living together also apply to adult children who may appreciate the support but resent their loss of independence. Um, a CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, film called Boomerang Generation turned the table of the usual concern with the care needs of the old and focused on the demands that younger generations are placing on their older parents. It reviewed various terms used to describe adult children who live with their parents. In Italy, I'll probably um, blow this pronunciation, but it's bemboccioni, meaning big babies. <laughs> and... In the, UK, in the UK, the term yuckies is used to refer to young, unwitting, costly kids. <laughs> Neither of these come off as flattering terms. Age war rhetoric can be nasty to both young and old adults. Parents also often look after their grandchildren so that their adult children can work and have affordable daycare. Among employed adults with children in the U.S., growing numbers are turning to their parents to care for their children a solution with a short shelf life given how many middle-aged and young old grandmothers are themselves in the labor force. Monetary exchanges between the generations typically favor the younger young generations. Research again consistently shows an impressive flow of resources from the old and middle-aged generations to younger generations until very old age, leading some to refer to the safety nets and scaffolding provided by parents to the young adult children. As well, the level of exchange that run, exchanges that run in both directions is responsive to the needs and the resources of the receiving party. It, shift, it shifts depending on which generation needs the help. Baby boomers, the common target of wrath and disdain, are currently the generation that transfers significant resources 
to younger family members. This brings me to the topic of um, emerging adulthood. The popular concept of emerging adulthood characterizes those aged 18 to 29 and following in the kind of trends I've just reviewed as, quote, no longer adolescents, not yet adults. Okay, we're talking about 18 to 29-year-olds here. One must ask, was it any more adult or mature to marry and have children in one's early 20s than it is to gain experience and knowledge, to travel to or engage in community service? In my view, the concept of emerging adulthood confuses changing markers of adulthood with whether one becomes an adult. Often implicit in this treatment is the assumption that today's young adults just don't want to grow up, are pampered, or feel entitled. As Rick Setterson has observed, a current challenge of young adulthood is managing uncertainty, risk, and delay. But in my view, that doesn't make it not adulthood. Working out the impact of the recession within families involves negotiating the growing ambivalence created by shifts in the timing of key life course events for both younger and older adults. Current transitions in timing feel off time, especially to older adults for whom this change is a break from previous experience. For younger adults, changes in life course scheduling are a break from expectations, but not from their personal experience. Such variations based on life stage mean the difference between experiencing the same situation as an instance of continuity or change, or of the familiar versus the strange, or of the taken for granted versus the remarkable. What about hits and misses? I, I think it's coming through, but I'll just give a summary here. Today's young adults and their parents expected that adulthood would bring emptiness for the parents and independence and employment for their children. In light of current circumstances, many of both generations have revised their plans. At the same time that more adult children are living at home to save money, baby boom parents are staying in the labor force longer, in part so that they can afford to assist their children and end in part to secure their own financial future. Retiring or shifting to lower or unpaid work are less attractive options when children are not financially secure. Attempts to get older workers out of higher paying jobs work at cross purposes, a miss, with the efforts of older family members to provide a safety net for their young adult members. In the absence of knowing that leaving their job will provide work for their children, more parents feel compelled to stay. At the same time, reducing or delaying public benefits that go to older people disproportionately affect lower-income workers who cannot afford to leave the labor force without them. They may also not be the workers who we most need to have in the economy or who are most able to work longer, an issue of intersecting class and possibly gender and race relations. Keeping these workers in the labor force longer also limits opportunities for younger workers. At the macro level, the lengthening job to tenure of older workers, mostly baby boomers, makes it more difficult for adults in their 20s and 30s to find steady work. Policies that promote employment among the young would be an impetus for some older parents to leave the labor force. Yet in Canada, at least, we are not making this a priority, and in fact, the federal government has dropped a number of programs, as that letter noted. In the end, both age groups must be served in order to fit initiatives in the public and private sectors to the realities of intergenerational exchanges in families. Policies that take into account how families and intergenerational ties work are critical to dealing effectively with the current recession. Pitting the old against the young misses the ongoing teamwork between age groups and generations that regularly occur in families. As advocates for the young and old, which I like to think we are, we should present a clear and loud voice each time reality is distorted in order to justify a policy as necessary because of an aging population or because of the excessive demands that older people are making on the public and private purse or because the young adults of today just refuse to grow up. So finally, I'd like to turn to my uh, third topic, which is gay and lesbian adults' relationships with siblings and parents. 
this will be a brief coverage of this topic, so there's a little time for discussion. Um, I've been working on this uh, topic, and it's based on a qualitative study, so I can't be definitive about how many people are in which circumstances, but it is an attempt to address a general failure to include in mainstream family life a group that is often ignored or excluded. Um, in part, it's to, a, an attempt to address the disconnect between the macro level limits to uh, full inclusion or equal inclusion and the micro level of what's actually happening in parents, in, sorry, in families. Given macro level limits to this full inclusion, I find exploring the ongoing ties of gay and lesbian adults with their family of origin can help to redress a misconception of gay and lesbian family members as necessarily outsiders to their families of origin, a current macro-micro miss. Of course, there is still too often a direct connection between macro-level exclusion, exclusion and the exclusion of family members who are gay or lesbian. But I think we have growing numbers and growing evidence of a situation where gay and lesbian family members are very much a part of that larger network. Uh, the second phase of my multi-generational families study involves 10 families that include the initial gay or lesbian adult uh, contact and as many of her or his siblings, uh, parents, uh, nieces, nephews who would uh, take part in the study. I'm going to mention a couple of um, observations. In one family, a very tight-knit family, we see active and involved relationships between the gay and lesbian adult, adults and their siblings and parents. I'm going to talk about one where the middle-aged daughter and her partner are very close to her siblings, are key support providers to her aging parents, and are very close to and involved with her nieces and nephews, despite the fact that her parents do not identify her as lesbian. This ambivalent family network is managed through a shared understanding among the siblings of their parents' limits to defining their daughter as lesbian even though they fully accept her partner as a family member. In other cases, a gay identity has never seemed to be an issue in the ongoing relationship with siblings and parents over time. In general, the gay or lesbian family member does not stand out from his or her siblings in amount of contact and degree of involvement with siblings and parents, even though there may have been challenging times in the past when the adult gay or lesbian person came out to his or her family. Clearly, a small study such as this um, is just a start, but it does help to redress as well or address as well the disconnect we have between our families and their families, what I might call another uh, miss within the meso level of analysis. Including gay and lesbian family members in the fabric of extended family networks rather than isolating them for a separate study, such as in studies of same-sex parents or same-sex parenting, helps to redress our tendency to talk about the culturally accepted our families and the still on the outside their families. Finally, I think that when we see evidence of inclusion at the micro level, that is when we study families as they're actually working that involve gay and lesbian adults, we see often the evidence of negotiating strong relationships with siblings and parents. And these observations may help us uh, work from the bottom up, if you will, in terms of promoting social change. As more families uh, uh, engage with their gay and lesbian family members, as more evidence is put forward that this is a, a family reality, with luck, the change will move up this upstream a bit to changes at the institutional and macro level. So in sum, I think we need multi-level analysis where we are making connections between the analysis and we really need to replace some of our misses with hits. This, if we do so, will enhance research and practice and policy. Thanks very much for your attention. I really welcome any comments you might have. So earlier, when you were sitting out there, I was supposed to be testing the mic, and I was supposed to, not this one, they're doing it for the telecast. So while I was up here and there was nobody else here, I was talking. So I just want you to be clear, that's why. Okay? I was talking out loud to test the mic <laughs> for the telecast. <laughs> and when I found out I was being recorded for the telecast, and Rick asked if that was okay, I said, yeah, that's okay. 
as long as I can see it, so I can check which mannerisms I should try to ditch, if, if I can, at <laughs> this stage. So do you have any comments or questions or observations, perhaps some observations about how the U.S. case might compare to Canadian information I've presented, or observations from your own work? Uh, I teach adult development and aging, and one of the things we have in the class debate about should Social Security be cut, and if it's going to be there, etc. Mm -hmm. And one young woman who I could have kissed said, I don't want them to cut Social Security because then if my folks had to support my grandparents, then they couldn't pay for my college. Yes, yes. Exactly. <laughs> very good. <laughs> And I think that's true in many families. If, if you take away from the older generation, it's going to have to come from someone farther down the line. Um, I, I, know, I do remember reading an article, and it was a U.S. case of a family relying on the income of their 80-year-old grandmother. You see that a, a lot in rural areas? The only sort of stable source of it. Right. Our system is a bit different. We have the Canada Pension Plan, which is a paid-into system, a social insurance scheme if you're in the labor force. And then old age security was initially meant to be a universal policy or program that went to all old people. And we've seen its ongoing erosion. So it, that began with clawbacks. So as soon as you hit a certain income level, you had to pay some of it back. So many people, in fact, end up paying it all back in taxes. And then, as I mentioned, we're extending the age of eligibility. Any other comments, questions? Margaret. Yeah, I think that one of the things that's interesting about this thing is because I spent a lot of time doing longitudinal research on families in poverty and Appalachia and talking to the middle generation of the young women. Mm -hmm. you know, so many of them had their, you know, just kind of what I swear was their dependence and interactions with their, their parents. Mm -hmm. They're predominantly mothers. Yeah. But what was interesting is, is the sense of uh, um, kind of the dual sense of, of dependence, the dependence within the family structure, a lot of them were living in multi generational houses, mm -hmm. they had to. And then, of course, dependence within the system that sets up temporary need for you know, temporary need for new family, so the, the, the dual dependence. And then the expectation that this older generation held, but a lot of times, that older generation was at risk themselves. Yeah. Not just workforce, but addiction, you know, chaotic family structure, multiple partners, presence of abuse when they were young. So it, it just it's just fascinating to me because it's and I think that population, these women that I talked to and observed over time, have lessons for current mm -hmm. issues. Kind of yes. Of that, that well, if you think of some of the comparative research on families that has been done over time and, and looking at differences based on income or sometimes differences based on race, yeah, there, we have a lot of wisdom already gained by families that didn't have resources and have had to turn to one another a lot. Um, you mentioned the idea of the, this generation in the middle, and I, what I find ironic in general, is this is really when aging is, uh, we're feeling the impact, shall we say, and it doesn't seem to be nearly as popular to fund and so on as it was 20 years ago when we were really looking a little farther off. Um, also, that's related to some concepts like the whole issue of the generation in the middle or the, the squeeze of being in the middle generation. We used to talk about that a lot as a big issue before it really was a big issue. Now other changes, like having children later, make it more and more likely. It's more likely you're going to have a child who's still a dependent age at the same time that you're going to have an older parent. And of course, that's magnified if, as well as uh, changes in age of when you have your first child, you're also dealing with limited resources in the wake of the recession. And also the limitations for this population I'm talking about, they have children. Mm -hmm. So they want a parent, mm -hmm. therefore they want a parent where they want a parent, but mm -hmm. there's some... Structural constraints to yeah. them alive and do that, and they have this parent that's also their parent telling them how to parent, and they're dependent on that for care. So yeah. it's just, it's just, it's rich. Yeah, it must be. It must be very overwhelming to be in the middle of it. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Okay, well, then, then I'll thank you all for being here, and uh, look forward to some one on one conversation if you would like that. Thanks.